Caring for Kids God's Way, a biblical counseling certificate program in child advocacy developed by the American Association of Christian Counselors through Light University. Your ministry is to be a Galatians 6-2 helper. Ours is to equip you with the highest level of advanced training from the world's leading Christian counselors. 24 experts teaming up to create the most comprehensive child studies curriculum for the personal classroom. May the Lord bless your study as you begin Caring for Kids God's Way. partner in the Lyles and Crawford Clinical Consulting Practice, psychologist for Westminster Schools Atlanta, former director of a Rafa inpatient unit for children, and author of The Obsessive Compulsive Trap. Caring for Kids God's Way presents Dr. Mark Crawford, Anxiety in Children and Teens. Hi, my name is Dr. Mark Crawford, and today I want to talk to you about anxiety disorders in children and teenagers. Now, if you work with children or teenagers, there's a very likely chance that you're going to encounter a child or teenager with an anxiety disorder. In fact, studies show that pediatric anxiety disorders are among the most prevalent forms of childhood psychopathology. One study showed that 20%, or in, in other words, one out of five children or teenagers will experience an anxiety disorder at some point during their lifetime. So if you work with teens or children on a regular basis, there's a very good chance that you almost certainly run into a child who is having some type of anxiety disorder. Now one of the reasons it's important to understand anxiety disorders is because children with anxiety disorders often manifest these in ways that don't necessarily look like an anxiety disorder. In other words, very rarely does a child come up and tell you that they have an anxiety disorder or that they talk about it with terms that describe anxiety. However, if you understand that some of these symptoms are possibly manifesting an anxiety disorder, then you can be helpful in working with the child or the teenager or in helping the family get in touch with somebody who can be helpful to them. Let me give you a few examples of how anxiety disorders can be misunderstood. A child, for example, with a social anxiety disorder in a classroom will rarely speak up may look shy, withdrawn, um, or even uninterested. It's very common for a child with an anxiety disorder or a social anxiety disorder to be labeled as uninterested, unmotivated, or, or not caring at all about school, when in fact that's not at all what's going on. Another common example is a child who, for example, can't concentrate because of some kind of obsessive anxiety, and we'll talk more about this in detail a little bit later, but they can look very distractible, and obviously the first thing people think of when they see a distractible kid is perhaps this is a child with ADD. And what we know from the literature is that oftentimes kids with anxiety disorders are misdiagnosed as having attention problems, and then they're treated uh, inaccurately. Ross Green, a psychologist from Boston, has said this, our explanations guide our interventions. I think this is a great quote and speaks to what I'm referring to here, and that is this. If we see a child acting in a certain way or a teenager, and we explain that behavior a certain way, that guides our intervention. In other words, we're going to react to that child in the way that our explanation determines we should act. If it makes sense that this is what's going on, this is how we're going to act. Unfortunately, if we don't have a proper explanation or if we misunderstand what the behavior is telling us, then our intervention or our response to that could be very wrong and sometimes even harmful. So today, the whole purpose of my talk to you is to help you become more familiar with what is an anxiety disorder in a child or a teenager. How does it look? How does it manifest? And perhaps give you some better understanding of how to identify a child who might have an anxiety disorder. Now, anxiety disorders come in many forms. I want you to think of the term anxiety disorders like an umbrella under which there are seven specific individual anxiety disorders. And today I want to talk to you about each one of these and tell you how they manifest. There's a slide that you're going to see on your screen that lists each anxiety disorder. The first one is generalized anxiety disorder. The second is social phobia or sometimes referred to as social anxiety. Next is separation anxiety disorder. 
The fourth one is panic disorder. The next one is obsessive compulsive disorder, which a lot of people don't realize is actually one of the anxiety disorders. Next is post-traumatic stress disorder. And finally, specific phobias. Now these are the seven specific anxiety disorders that fall under that realm, that big heading of anxiety disorders. And they, they look very different from one another. So what I want to do today is talk to you about each one and help you recognize what it looks like in a child or a teenager. Now first, let's talk about generalized anxiety disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder is really characterized by one main ingredient, and that's worry. Kids with generalized anxiety disorder worry a lot. Uh, everybody worries occasionally, and obviously at, at sometimes we would expect one to worry. If you've got a big test coming up as a child or a teenager, or if there's a big date that you're going on, there's a certain amount of worry that you sort of anticipate or expect. However, kids with a generalized anxiety disorder worry excessively and far beyond what one would expect for the situation at hand. Kids with generalized anxiety disorder don't just worry every now and then, they worry most of the time. In fact, their worry is m present more days than, it, than it's not present. And they find that their worry is almost impossible to control. Kids with generalized anxiety can worry about almost anything. But what we found is that some of the typical things that they worry about include the following. And you'll see a screen on your list that will show you some of the specific worries. For example, kids with generalized anxiety disorder frequently worry about the health of their parents. Now, most of the time, there's no reason to worry about the health, the health of their parents. In other words, their parents haven't suffered any kind of illness or disease or accident, but they're constantly worried that something might happen to a parent or a caretaker. Next, kids with generalized anxiety disorder frequently worry about being kidnapped or abducted. Now, this is certainly not helped by news reports of children who have been abducted, and, and certainly we see those often, but this will trigger all kinds of worries that it might happen to them. Another frequent area of worry for kids with generalized anxiety are storms. Uh, I've had kids in my practice who were almost obsessed with watching the Weather Channel to see what the reports were about the weather. And I actually had one child who, if it, cl if it got cloudy at all, would want to immediately go inside and take shelter. The worry was that there would be a horrible storm. Sometimes the worries are a bit more mundane, like grades. Um, sometimes kids worry about the future. In other words, what am I going to do when I grow up? Am I going to be able to get a job? Am I going to get married? Am I going to make enough money? Um, any kind of worry about the future. Another type of thing kids with generalized anxiety disorder will worry about includes the environment. A lot of kids worry about pollu pollutants, toxins. Um, I had one child in my practice who worried about emissions. If they saw a car going down the road that uh, was uh, smoking or, or certainly needed a new emissions inspection, uh, they would immediately begin to worry about the environment and the ozone and things like that. Germs are a frequent worry with kids with generalized anxiety disorder. And these could be everything from common germs like just the cold or the flu to more elaborate germs. I've had kids worry about illnesses they, they really have never seen, um, uh, things they heard about on the TV or, or in the news. And of course, any other kind of worries. The, these are just a, a list of the common ones, but certainly there are a host of other things that kids with generalized anxiety disorder worry about. Now, in addition to just the worry that goes on in their head, kids with generalized anxiety also often develop physical symptoms that accompany their anxiety. For example, on the next slide we'll give you a few examples. Kids with generalized anxiety are often very restless. Um, they, they have a hard time just relaxing and sitting still. And once again, restlessness oftentimes is associated with attention deficit disorder. So a lot of times people see a child who's restless and assume maybe there's something like that going on when in fact it could just be anxiety. Fatigue is another physical symptom. Worry wears you out. When you worry a lot, you get tired. And so fatigue is often a physical symptom. Kids with generalized anxiety often exhibit muscle tension uh, and sleep problems, especially insomnia. In fact, a lot of the kids that I have actually discovered suffered, suffered from a generalized anxiety disorder actually were diagnosed after their parents brought them to me because of problems sleeping. For example, children with the generalized anxiety disorder 
frequently have trouble sleeping alone. Um, and so what will happen is parents will battle with the child about going to bed. The kids avoid going to bed. They don't want to go to sleep. Um, they wind up getting up in the middle of the night, coming into the parent's room. And so the parents will oftentimes come to me and they'll be just exasperated by the fact that their child can't go to bed or won't go to bed. And they, they'll get into these r horrible power struggles. And once I spend some time with the child, what becomes real clear to me, not always, but sometimes, is that these children are full of anxiety. And nighttime is often when their worries come to the surface or, or really explode. And so they just simply can't stay in their room alone. It's just too frightening and, and anxiety producing for them. And in addition, you often see all kinds of physical problems like stomach aches or headaches accompanying their worry. Now, kids with generalized anxiety, in addition to being worried and showing physical symptoms, often show certain characteristics such as perfect, perfectionism or conscientious, conscientiousness about their performance. They also tend to be very self-conscious and often self-critical. They seek frequent and excessive reassurance as well. So, if you think about what does a child with generalized anxiety disorder look like, oftentimes you'll see that they're just really worried, very serious, self-conscious, perfectionistic kids who have a hard time just letting things go. They worry about things in excess to what they should be worrying about them, and they have trouble relaxing at all. Um, if they need reassurance, it's usually specific to something that they're worried about. For example, if a child is worrying about somebody breaking in their house, which is another frequent thing kids with generalized anxiety disorder worry about, they may seek frequent reassurance about are the doors locked, is the alarm system on, uh, is the neighborhood safe, etc. If a child is worried about a parent or the health of a parent, they may ask repeated questions about the parent's well-being. Now, unfortunately, reassurance, even when given in liberal amounts, might give the child temporary relief. In other words, the anxiety may decrease initially, but it's going to come back, and it's going to come back quickly. So reassuring alone just simply isn't going to help children with generalized anxiety disorder. And oftentimes, parents grow weary of the amount of reassurance that kids with generalized anxiety disorder will require. Generalized anxiety disorder shows up in very young kids as well as teenagers. The research shows that it usually starts early, in other words, when children are young, and continues throughout childhood into the teen years and even into adulthood if it's not addressed. Like most types of generalized anxiety disorder, it exists on a continuum. In other words, it could be very mild or it could be severe. Kids with mild generalized anxiety oftentimes can hide their anxiety or mask the symptoms, and so they can go for a long time, years, without anyone ever really picking up on it. However, kids with more severe generalized anxiety disorder find it more difficult to hide their anxiety. Consequently, it's easier to spot and a little bit, it affects their life a little bit more severely. Now, the next anxiety disorder I want to talk to you about is social anxiety. This is a relatively new diagnosis or term that we've, we're just beginning to, to understand and, and learn more about. A social phobia or social anxiety is a fear of social situations and the kids that have social anxiety are usually very inhibited or timid in social situations. A child or teenager with social phobia experiences a great deal of discomfort anytime they're in a social situation and it's usually accompanied by physical symptoms as well. The next slide that you're going to see talks about some of those symptoms. For example, kids with generalized anxiety can experience heart palpitations, in other words their heart can start racing, Oftentimes, they're very shaky or trembly in social situations. Sweating is frequently associated with generalized anxiety. Their palms may get sweaty a lot, and in more severe cases, they may actually develop a lot of perspiration under their arms or actually just all over. Uh, nausea is oftentimes associated with uh, social anxiety, as well as flushing or chills. Now, there's some common triggers to social anxiety. And for kids or adolescents with social phobia, I'm going to give you a list of some of the more common triggers or situations in which kids with social anxiety really experience a rise in their anxiety or have difficulty. And the next slide will, will point these out to you. The first is reading aloud in class. Kids with social anxiety will frequently tell me that they sit terrified in class that the teacher will call on them to read something out loud because that puts them on stage, and that's really a terrifying thought for them. 
The next one is musical or, or athletic performances. And in my experience, I find that um, athletic performances involving uh, things like baseball or tennis are particularly triggering because these are more individualized. A kid getting up to bat, all eyes are on him or her, um, or a child playing tennis. Usually there's only one or two people uh, on the, or two to four people on the court, so the eyes are, are on them. They feel on stage, so their anxiety really gets triggered. Joining in a conversation is also a very difficult thing for a child with an anxiety disorder. Uh, so, for example, uh, if a child's in the lunchroom or they're in the hallway and all the kids are talking, they find it very difficult, if not impossible, to step in and just join in the conversation. Speaking to adults is another common trigger for kids with social anxiety. Starting a conversation is extraordinarily difficult. For example, if a child is with another child, they have a hard time initiating a conversation or thinking of something to talk about. Attending dances or school activities are very intimidating and frightening for a child with social anxiety. Taking tests is oftentimes very anxiety producing. Going to parties is another one. Being called on to answer a question in class is very anxiety producing for these kids. And any kind of group meeting or project is also an, an, a situation where kids have enormous anxiety in these kinds of situations. Now, because of the anxiety associated with these kinds of events, kids with social anxiety typically avoid any kind of situation like I just mentioned to you. Now, that makes sense when you think about it, because if they're in a situation like this or they're approaching a situation and their anxiety suddenly goes up, if they opt out, or in other words, they avoid that situation, they immediately feel better. So it's very reinforcing to them. So it's very difficult for a child with social anxiety to push through that anxiety and speak up in class or join in a conversation or step out of that comfort zone. Kids with social anxiety experience distress almost every day. 60% of their anxiety occurs at school because that's where they spend a lot of their time. And we find that social anxiety usually peaks around age 11 or 12, but it can show up in even very young children. We're not sure why 11 or 12 is the peak age, but we believe that it's because it's around this time that social activities are less structured and the peer group becomes more important for children. So around this time, a child with social anxiety really starts to get anxious in social situations. Now, the next anxiety disorder that I want to talk to you about is separation anxiety disorder. Most people have heard about separation anxiety disorder, but we should talk about it a little bit. This type of anxiety disorder really affects younger children. In other words, it usually peaks between seven and nine years of age. And what you see in kids with separation anxiety disorder is an unrealistic, excessive fear of separating from the parent, and it really affects their daily life. For example, a parent might try to leave the child uh, in daycare or at school or drop them off at Sunday school and what happens is these kids have an enormous fear reaction. They really get anxious about this and they experience real anxiety once the parent leaves accompanied by a fear that the parent might not come back or something might happen to the parent while they're gone. Now in almost every case there's no trauma or realistic thing that's happened to cause this anxiety. For example, a lot of times parents uh, and reason, understandably they do this, they look for reasons for this to occur. In other words, a child has separation anxiety, so they're looking for the event that might have triggered it. And in our experience, what we find is there usually is not one. In other words, these kids have never, uh, rarely have these kids with separation anxiety disorder been abandoned or left or their parents you know, didn't come back and get them. It just comes up almost spontaneously and it's very irrational. There's no real basis for their excessive fear of being apart from their parent. Because of the enormous fear involved around separation, kids with separation anxiety oftentimes try to get out of going, being in a situation where their parents will leave them. So for example, a child of school age will start to develop physical symptoms, or in other words, they'll just kind of get sick uh, instead of, for example, going to school. So a child with separation anxiety, uh, come Monday morning, will start developing stomach aches and headaches, and I just don't feel good. I don't think I should go to school today. And so, uh, frankly, a lot of times separation anxiety 
is diagnosed by pediatricians when the parents take the kids in all the time because the kids are complaining of being sick and the pediatrician finds nothing wrong and then come to find out, gee, this happens a lot on Monday morning and school days, and so we see a pattern here. Now, the good news about separation anxiety disorder is that eventually kids grow out of separation anxiety disorder. You, you really don't see 18-year-olds with separation anxiety disorder. However, um, oftentimes with intervention, we can get the child past that a lot sooner and if the child is having separation anxiety dis disorder without help, it can really be um, difficult for the parents and for the teenagers. The next anxiety disorder I want to talk about is panic disorder. Now, panic disorder <clears throat> is simply a disorder that involves a lot of panic attacks. A panic attack is an acute, sudden fear reaction. Now, the best way to explain a panic attack is with an example. And let me tell you about an example of a panic attack, <clears throat> or at least a reaction like a panic attack, that I went through one time. I live in Atlanta, and near Atlanta is a place called Six Flags, which is fun and great place to take your kids and go. And so I was at Six Flags one time, <clears throat> and I'll never forget this. This was years and years ago. I got on this ride called the Free Fall Freeze, and it looked pretty fun. And what happens is you get in this ride, and it's a little elevator-like thing. You sit in it like a cage. It takes you up, oh, it feels like about 7,000 feet above the ground. It's not quite that high. And it suspends you there for a few minutes. And then all of a sudden, it drops you. And you fall for what feels like about 35 minutes, but I'm sure it's about three seconds. You just free fall, and then you stop at the bottom. Well, I didn't realize what that feeling would be like, but when it dropped me, all of a sudden... I had what probably is as close to a panic attack as I'm ever going, as, as I hope to ever have. My heart started flying. I got this sort of tingly um, numbness, um, and I found found it very hard to breathe, and it was just terrifying. Um, I haven't ridden it since. Probably never will. But um, it was an awful, awful experience. Now. What I felt during that ride is probably as much of a, a, a mimicking a panic attack as, as you can ever get. Panic attacks involve some real specific physical symptoms, and the next slide will show those to you. Panic attacks involve uh, any of the following symptoms, heart racing, uh, sweating or perspiration, shaking or trembling, a feeling of choking or difficulty breathing, might get a tingling sensation, oftentimes hot flashes or chills, dizziness, chest pain or discomfort, a fear of losing control, or a fear of dying. Now, people who have panic attacks tell you that it's one of the most awful experiences that you can actually ever have. They usually peak in intensity within 5 to 10 minutes of onset, and they usually subside within 15 to 30 minutes. So they don't last a long time, but again, if you're having one, it feels like an eternity. Most people don't know when they have a, pa a panic attack, what it is. Uh, a movie a few years ago, a funny movie called Analyze This, showed Robert De Niro as a gangster who was having panic attacks, and he thought he was having heart attacks. Uh, and oftentimes that's what happens when a person has a panic attack. They think something physically is going on with them, and it's very scary. In children, a panic attack can look a lot like a temper tantrum. I've seen kids have a panic attack. It's pretty frightening to watch. And oftentimes, they'll just sort of get uh, explosive, and they'll look like they're throwing a tantrum. And again, they don't realize they're having a panic attack. And oftentimes, if they do understand what it is, it can help them uh, deal with it a little bit better. Almost everyone who has a panic attack experiences something we call anticipation, anticipatory anxiety and avoidance, meaning this. Once you have a panic attack, people fear having the next one, and it almost preoccupies them. And oftentimes people with panic attacks will start to try to figure out what caused it, what, what's, what was I doing, um, what were the situations, and they'll avoid anything that resembles the situation that, in which they had it in the first place. I remember working with a teenager one time who had a panic attack, and because he had it in a movie theater, he definitely wouldn't go to movies anymore. But then he started trying to figure out, well, what was it? Was it the dark? Was it that I was cold? Was it that I was hungry? And so he started associating all these conditions. And so he would start avoiding getting too cold or getting too hungry or being in a place that was too dark. And the truth was none of those things were really the triggers. 
but he began avoiding things that he thought might trigger it. But that's common with people with, anxiety, with panic attacks. Now, the next type of anxiety disorder is obsessive compulsive disorder. Most people have heard of, of obsessive compulsive disorder, but again, they don't think of it as a part of the family of anxiety disorders. Now, obsessive compulsive disorder affects about one in 40 people worldwide. Um, and I should say that OCD, I'll call obsessive compulsive disorder OCD to, to um, make it easier. OCD and really all of the anxiety disorders kind of run in families. In other words, we think that there's a strong genetic basis for anxiety disorders. There are two features of OCD. The first feature is obsessions, which we, obsessions we characterize as persistent ideas, thoughts, worries, or images that come into their mind or come into your head just sort of like a missile, and they cause a lot of anxiety. The second feature of OCD are compulsions, and these are the things we're more familiar with. Compulsions are behaviors or mental things that we do that we do sort of ritualistically to prevent anxiety or to reduce anxiety. Now, we find that there are certain things people obsess about and certain things that uh, people do compulsively. And the next slide will show you a little bit about the types of things people have obsessions about. And again, you can have obsessions about other things, but these are the common ones. The first one is contamination. In other words, people fear being contaminated, have running into germs, getting sick, um, and they have this in, inordinate excessive fear of germs and, and sickness. The next one is symmetry or exactness. <clears throat> and by this, what we mean is a lot of times people have this need for things to be even. It can be in their environment or it can be on their body. For example, I find that uh, a lot of people with OCD need to have the same amount of materials on one side of their nightstand as the other. And if it's uneven, they'll move it around to even it up. Uh, a lot of kids will have the same number of stuffed animals on each side of their bed. Um, a lot of times it will involve clothing. I've got kids who have to have their shoes tied exactly the same tension on each foot. And if it doesn't feel even, they'll untie and retie them until it feels even. And that goes on and on. I could give you a thousand examples of that. The next type of obsession is uh, aggressive obsessions. And this really refers to thoughts or images that are aggressive in nature. I've got a child with OCD, for example, who cannot see a fork up, turned upward on the table. She has to turn it so the tines of the fork are pointing downward because if they're not, she has this image of taking the fork and stabbing herself with it. She's never done it, she never will, but the image is so anxiety producing, she can't see something that might make her think of that. Um, sexual obsessions aren't what it sounds like. This is not obsessive sexual acting out. These involve worries about sexual behavior that might be inappropriate. This is especially common for adolescent boys, and the most common is the fear that they will be attracted to another boy. For example, a lot of boys with OCD will worry obsessively that, what if I'm gay? What if I, what if I see a guy and I'm attracted to him? Now, um, in almost no situation is, has the guy ever acted out, or is this a problem, but it's the obsessive worry that it might happen that torments them. And that's true with all of these obsessions. It's not that they happen, it's that they might happen. The next kind of uh, obsession involves religious obsessions. And the most common one here is the fear that they have committed the unpardonable sin or that they've blasphemed. And this comes from reading uh, Matthew 12. And what happens here is they feel that they have done something unforgivable. Now, I've got, I've got about five patients in my practice who struggle with this particular obsession. Another one involves the fear that they've lost their salvation or that they were never saved. Uh, and these things torment these, these young people. Somatic obsessions involve the body. And what this might involve is uh, a fear that they've got cancer or that they've got AIDS. And every little tingle and twitch means something awful. Um, if, they, if they find a little skin blemish, then obviously it's skin cancer. If they feel a little tingling in the throat, it must be something awful, some horrible disease. Doubting obsessions involve the fear that I might not have done something. For example, I've got people who leave the house and start thinking, what if I didn't turn off the lights and the house catches on fire? Uh, what if I didn't turn off the shower and I flood the house? 
Uh, and the last one is what we call just so obsessions. In other words, things have to be done just so. Um, maybe uh, a lot of times it involves the body. I have to put my hands in a certain position and I have to do it just right. Uh, or I have to take a step and I have to step exactly the right way. And these things can become just tormenting to people. Now, all of these things we just talked about are, again, what we call obsessions, things that, that you worry about or think about. Compulsions are things that people do, and compulsions are oftentimes in response to the obsessions, and they're done to prevent or reduce anxiety. Now, there are many, many things that people uh, do in terms of compulsive behaviors. Let me give you a list, and if you'll look at the next slide, I've listed some of these for you. A very frequent, a very frequent one, and one that we are all familiar with are cleaning or washing compulsions. In other words, frequent hand washing. I've got kids who've washed their hands so often they have to buy special lotions to put on their skin. Um, it can also involve cleaning the environment. Um, I've got kids who uh, are so concerned about germs that they uh, are obsessed with Lysol. They spray everything that they come in contact with. Another type of compulsion are hoarding or collecting compulsions, and this involves the inability to throw anything out. A lot of people with OCD fear that they're going to part with something that they need, so they can't throw out anything. Checking compulsions involve going back and checking to make sure things are done. They may go back and check that they've turned something off four, five, six times. They may go back to make sure that they've done something uh, many times. Repeating compulsions involve saying something uh, over and over, they may repeat phrases or words. Ordering and arranging compulsions involve things in your environment, meaning all the things have to line up or be in a particular order, things in your drawer, your closet, or, or on your desk, or even in your book bag. Blinking and staring compulsions involve looking at something to a certain count. For example, I can't blink until I count to 10, or I have to look at an object until it's out of sight or blinking, blinking in a pattern or certain, um, certain number of times. Rubbing, touching, and tapping compulsions really involve going back and having to touch objects or having to rub objects a certain number of times. Somatic compulsions follow somatic obsessions and oftentimes involve things like checking. I, I find people checking for lumps or checking their skin or a lot of times people checking their vision to see if there's anything wrong with their eyes. And finally, mental compulsions oftentimes involve things in, people do in their heads. I've got people who do math problems in their heads, or they have, to, uh, they have to spell words that people say. In other words, somebody will say a word, and they have to spell it in their head, and they feel they have to do these things. The, the hallmark of compulsions are these are behaviors people, they feel like they have to do. If they don't, they're tremendously anxious, or they fear something bad might happen. Now, the most common compulsions in children or teens involve cleaning, checking, counting things, repeating, touching, and straightening. Those are the ones we see most often in kids. OCD is a sort of a, a fascinating and complex disorder. It really exists on a continuum, and there are a lot of people who have very mild forms of OCD, and it really doesn't interfere all that much with their life. In fact, you may be listening to this and thinking, oh my goodness, I hear some of that myself. That's okay. A lot of people with some mild forms of OCD really never have it interfere with their life. But in many cases, it can be so severe that it can cause great uh, detrimental effects on the person's functioning. Now, the next type of anxiety disorder I want to talk about is post-traumatic stress disorder. The, and for short, we'll call it PTSD. PTSD is a type of anxiety disorder that involves children who have experienced a traumatic event. And that could be something like a car accident. It can be a life-threatening disaster such as a hurricane or a tornado. And certainly it can involve some kind of physical or sexual abuse that they've experienced. One study found that children are exposed to high magnitude traumas at an alarmingly high rate. For example, one study showed that 40% of kids have been exposed to a trauma sufficient to contribute to symptoms of PTSD. Now, in PTSD, what happens is the child re-experiences the trauma in the form of intrusive thoughts, memories, dreams, or even flashbacks. For example, if they've been in a terrible car accident, they may dream about that or, or uh, suddenly just feel like they're in that wreck again or they'll have horrible images or recollections of it. They usually try to avoid these thoughts and feelings that cause them or, or, or activities that cause them to remember the event. 
Now, in kids with PTSD, you see what we call an increased arousal state. And the next slide will give you some of the symptoms of what that might look like. For example, kids with PTSD have real trouble sleeping. A lot of times you'll see insomnia or they'll wake a lot during the night. Oftentimes they're very irritable. Sometimes they're quite needy and clingy. Uh, most of the time they have trouble concentrating. You'll see an exaggerated startle response. For example, kids with PTSD are seem to be always on guard. They're easily startled. For example, a child can be in a room and if someone walks in unannounced, they jump or they, they seem like they've, they've been terrified or frightened. Um, oftentimes noises can really startle somebody with PTSD. For example, if somebody drops something, they'll really jump and, and, and show a, an almost exaggerated startle response, one more than you would expect. Also in PTSD, you can see outbursts of aggression. Kids with PTSD will, will be so hyper aroused, they can just lash out oftentimes. And again, that can look like a temper tantrum. The thing to understand is that if a kid has been exposed to a trauma, accidents, injuries, sometimes illnesses, a kid who's been through a tremendous illness like cancer or something very life-threatening, can develop post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. And finally, I want to talk to you about specific phobias. And specific phobias are fears associated, an, an irrational or an inordinate fear to a specific object. Now, there are several kinds of things that people can develop a phobia of, around, but there are five common ones that I want to talk to you about today. The first involves animal types of phobias, uh, and this can be a fear of a snake, spiders, dogs, a combination of the above, rodents, um, anything like that. And oftentimes what you'll see is you'll see children who are just terrified of exposure to animals. I had a, a child who is absolutely terrified of dogs. Um, now, the strange thing was that they had a dog, uh, but that dog didn't count. Any other dog in the neighborhood, this child was terrified of, um, to the point that he didn't want to go catch the bus because one of the dogs in the neighborhood might get loose, and that would be very terrifying for him. Uh, another type of phobia involves what we call natural environment type phobias, and some of these should come up on your screen. This might involve things like storms, heights, uh, water, uh, things like that, anything in, in your natural environment. Um, and this, again, sometimes they overlap. Uh, a child with generalized anxiety who worries about storms can actually develop a specific phobia around storms so that they're terrified of, of that particular thing. The next category would involve what we call blood injection or injury type. We lump all those together. And what you see here is a child who might be terrified of seeing blood or seeing an injury. Uh, they might be terrified of receiving an, uh, an injection of some kind or any kind of medical procedure. And it, of course, all kids hate getting shots. All kids hate going to the dentist or, or having a medical procedure done. But in a specific phobia, it goes beyond I don't really want to go, it is I can't go, and they'll freak out if they have to go. So the, the fear is irrational and excessive. The next type of phobia is what we call situational type phobias, bridges, elevators, flying on airplanes, etc. And uh, this is not uncommon. What we see is kids who, for example, I've got a kid in my practice who can't ride the elevator to my office, uh, has to go up the stairs because elevators are very terrifying. And then finally, we have other types of phobias that don't fall in one of those four categories. And those can be things like costume characters, um, loud noises. I had a child in my practice who had a specific phobia to the fire alarm. In other words, the fire drill was so terrifying to this child that the school had to tell the parent the day before, we're going to have a fire drill tomorrow. It's going to be at this time because if they didn't and the child was sitting there and the fire alarm went off, the child would have a panic attack and would have an enormous fear reaction. And it was specific to that one thing. So phobias can, can be common like fear of snakes or, or fear of flying, or they can be rather obscure like fear of a fire alarm. And that's one that I actually saw. Now, as I said earlier, Anxiety disorders really fall on a continuum. On the one hand, they can be very mild, and on the, one hand, on the other hand, they can be very severe and debilitating. 
Um, today, what I hope to, to accomplish is to help you understand how anxiety disorders can show up in a child or a teenager. Um, very rarely does a child have a language that will communicate to you that they're having fears and anxieties and phobias. And once again, remember that no one likes to admit that they're afraid or that they're scared, particularly an adolescent or an older child, because that just seems to be um, uncool. So they will hide or mask their anxiety. So oftentimes anxiety disorders don't show up like anxiety disorders. They're the great masquerader. They show up in other ways, oftentimes behavior problems, attention problems, uh, things like that. So I hope what I've given you is a way to recognize how these things might show up in a child with an anxiety disorder. Now, while beyond the scope of our conversation today, um, the good news is mo almost all anxiety disorders are very treatable. And with the right intervention, we can usually get kids in a better place to really get them to overcome their anxiety disorders. I want to give you a little tool that um, I use in my practice, and I'm comfortable recommending it because if a child has mild anxiety, then this can be very helpful to them. Uh, and what I do, and when I say mild anxiety, I'm talking about a child is, is a real worrier or they're concerned about situations that, um, that you probably don't need specific clinical intervention for. But let me give you something that, that I find to be very helpful, particularly for children with mild generalized anxiety disorder. What I'll do is I'll have children or teenagers or even adults for that matter take a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle. And on the left-hand column, I'll have them write, I can control, or in my control, and on the right hand, I'll have them write out of my control. And then I'll say, think about everything right now that you're worried about or that you're having anxiety about. And I want you to decide which column that goes into. And so we'll talk it through, and oftentimes what we'll find is that at least half of the things they can, that they worry about, they cannot control. These are things that they, they can't do anything about. And so they'll put them on that right-hand column some of the things they actually can do something about. For example, if they're worried about a test, they can study, they can prepare, they can get help from the teacher. So that goes in the left-hand column. Then what I do is I say, all right, let's take everything in your left-hand column and let's come up with a plan for each one of these things. If you can do something about it, let's define what you can do and let's come up with an action plan. Now what we find is that when we start to do that, anxiety levels begin to drop. When I have a plan, when I know what I can do about the thing I'm worried about, not only does my anxiety go down, but I actually begin to see that I can change the situation. But for the other column, they say, well, what about this stuff? I can't control. Uh -huh. Here's what we're going to do with that. Since you can't do anything about it, what I want you to do is I want you to take that list, rip the paper in half, let's take the column of the things you can't control, I want you to fold it up and let's put it in an envelope. And in that envelope, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take it and on the out of that outside of that envelope, I like to write one of my favorite scriptural references that help me to understand I'm turning this over to God. In other words, if I can't do anything about it, I'm going to give it to somebody who I know can. And obviously one of the ones that we use a lot is Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7. And what that says is, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. People with anxiety need the peace of God that transcends understanding. And writing that scripture verse, or actually writing that whole thing on that envelope, can be a reminder. Another one that I like to use is from Matthew. The passage is from Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34, which starts saying this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. And that passage ends by saying, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. And what I like to do uh, is talk to people who are worrying and say, you know, all these things you're worried about that you can't control, you don't have to do anything about it because you're going to give these to God. And when you look at that envelope, it's to remind you that they're in God's hands, not yours. So you don't have to let it take up disk space in your head. You give that over. And I found that for a lot of people, that's a nice, helpful technique, and it helps them to take all their energy, and instead of focusing on the things they can't control, it helps them focus on the parts of their life they're worried about that they actually can do something about, and now they've got a nice action plan for all of those things. 
Also for kids who have a lot of anxiety, I like to have them do some imagery. And one of my favorite images comes from the passage from Luke chapter 8, verses 20 through, 22 through 25. And this is a familiar story for most people. And what we see is that the, Jesus and the disciples get in a boat and they're crossing over on, on the sea and a great storm comes up. And I like the storm as a metaphor for anxiety. The winds are howling and the waves are raging. And, and frankly, the disciples are afraid they're going to die. I think they might have been having a little panic attack in the boat. But the storm's raging and they think, okay, this is it. End of the line, we're going to die. And all of a sudden, they wake up Jesus. And Jesus steps up and he calms the storm. And what they say in verse 25 is, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. And what I like to have people do when they're starting to feel anxious and, and, and worried about things is, is to say, you know what, I want you to focus on, on this for a minute. Your life is like this boat. The storm is the anxiety all around you. But Christ is in there with you, and I want you to picture him. And I want you to understand the same person who can, with a word, calm the waves and the wind also can calm your anxiety. And that metaphor and that image can be very helpful, especially I find for young children who really like to have something tangible to think about and to help remind them that, you know what, I'm not in this alone. And in fact, yeah, he is right here with me and he can help me with this. Now, for kids with mild social phobia or specific phobias, one of the things that we find is that they have to confront the thing they fear. Avoiding the situation only makes the anxiety more, uh, more fierce. It makes it stronger. So one of the things we try to do, both in my practice and I get parents to do, is encourage these kids to gradually and gently confront those things that they're afraid of. Because obviously the fears are really irrational and the thing they fear is probably not going to happen, meaning they're not going to be humiliated in class if they read out loud, etc. So one of the things we do is we really encourage them to kind of, with courage, face that fear. And out of Joshua, I like to quote the verse, be strong and courageous. And that's sort of the motto of dealing with anxiety, be strong and courageous. And oftentimes that can be helpful for kids to say, okay, I can confront this and I can overcome this because I'm not doing it alone. Now let me caution you, with some types of anxiety disorders, these things will work very effectively, particularly on the mild end. However, for some forms of anxiety disorders, these things are pretty severe, and oftentimes they involve even some neurochemical kind of imbalances that need to be addressed from a medical perspective. So if you're working with children and teenagers and you identify any of these anxiety disorders, I think it's fine to try some of the techniques that, that we've talked about in helping children develop some tools to work with managing their anxiety. However, if the anxiety disorder is more severe, you really should try to refer them to an appropriate mental health professional to get some more specific treatment. The two types of treatment most often used are what we call cognitive behavior therapy and even medication. And what I would say about that, a lot of times people are reticent to, to look at medication as an alternative for children, but we found that kids with anxiety disorders respond very safely and effectively if needed to medication and that the medication is most often a very short-term kind of thing. They're not going to require it forever. But if the anxiety is causing the child to not be able to go to school or they can't interact at all, sometimes this can get them to the place where they actually can do those things so that they can respond to more specific kinds of therapy. I hope this has been helpful in giving you some ways to identify what might be an anxiety disorder so that you can make some appropriate referrals or even help a child manage anxiety more effectively. Thank you.